Bills, subordinate, led, uh, subordinate legislation, and this is maintained regularly by a team of editorial staff that we have on premise. Uh, then we also have case law, which is all the major cases from the Constitutional Court, Criminal Court, uh, Human Rights, Arbitration, Labor, Competition, Pensions, Intellectual Property, and Tax Cases. Uh, then we have the Government Gazette, so every time the government changes regulation or makes any decisions, they release that information in the Government Gazette. Uh, we go and take that Government Gazette, disseminate it into pieces, put it on the research platform for everybody to, to be able to see. And then, obviously, with all of this legal information, uh, you have a requirement for commentary. So we have professional authors which go and basically dissect an act and they release a publication based on that. So you'll have uh, a, a commentary work which basically stipulates what does the, the, the criminal act or uh, any one of these acts actually mean and what is it, how does the regulations affect you and it's, it's just a write-up uh, of what that is. So yeah, so you can see this, it's a diverse uh, content set and uh, each of these contain its own set of related metadata. So you'll have a case law document which will have a case name, a case number, uh, the judges that was involved, uh, who are the parties, what sort of uh, topics were covered in the case, and then obviously the entire judge's judgment gets stored and people search that for their research when trying to uh, plan for a case that they need to, to argue in court. Uh, so <coughs> we found that uh, because we chunk the information, we sometimes have issues with uh, term frequency. So we'll have some sections of the law, which is a document by itself, and a section can be a paragraph. So you can have documents that's uh, 7,000 characters or 7,000 words, and then you can have a document that's 20 words, which causes problems when you're looking at relevance for uh, term frequency and inverse document frequency. So for FAST, we sort of covered that relevance problem by introducing rank boost. FAST has a rank boost system where you can assign a integer value to every document and say this is its boost value, and then it calculates a relevance score and adds it to the relevance um, and then would return. So we would classify all our content and we'd say like legislation is very important so we give it a high uh, rank boost and then case law is also important and then the commentaries and it, it, it tapers down with, uh, with regards to importance. So when we do searches, obviously we can sort of manipulate what comes up as relevance because we know if somebody puts in this term they're probably going to look for this act which contains that case because the rank boost now pushes it up in the results set. Um, <coughs> when we migrated across to, to Elastic, uh, obviously there was no uh, rank boost, but open-ended fields uh, in Elastic schema is great, so we could basically take that legacy, attach the same thing, and we could swap that out with a functional score, and we can achieve the same results. Uh, and yeah, uh, to get the correct field value factor, we used a very scientific method, which was tune, test, and repeat, <laughs> and that went on for a week or so until we got it the way we want it. But today, uh, it's changing. So we, we're actually doing quite a bit of nice work on relevance uh, in, uh, in the department, and uh, yeah, none of that I'm actually putting in here. It's early days. We're still working on it, so I'm not going to do it. All right, so let's see. So now if we have a bunch of separate types of content, but you have one research platform, you have one search box there, and people would want to get in. Uh, how do they find their documents? So, so you can manipulate uh, um, the relevance by using, as I said, field boosting, which we use a functional score for, and, uh, and you'll probably not be able to see something like that, but um, there is a boost value, so if I do a query and I can say my title is probably very important. I can boost that title, and this is general uh, elastic query language. And you can boost any, any field. Uh, what we also found was, oh, damn, sorry. What we also found that was uh, very helpful was uh, the usage of acronyms and synonyms. So um, a lot of the time, people will just uh, call something by an acronym, and some of the editors would actually document something with an acronym. 
but the client might come in and type the full term, or the client might come in and type an acronym because everybody refers to that as an acronym, but the document only has the full term. So what was very helpful for us was, was the introduction of synonyms and acronyms where we can actually basically dual search both the terms. So if the acronym comes in, it searches for the acronym as well as the full term. And then <coughs> another thing that was very helpful for us is because we have the specified content types, we could actually supply focused search forms. So we could say, well, if you're looking for case law, we have a specific case law form for you to use where you can search against the individual fields. So we would create a form outside of the general search form, and this would have the, the related metadata fields available for individual match queries. Uh, and then again, because we started taking over the legacy of rank boost and we have a doc rank value, we could use a functional score uh, to manipulate the query uh, into a field value factor where we say, okay, this field modify it by its square root value and sum that onto the relevance value, and then you can manipulate what comes back in that fashion. Now all of this, is, as you start looking at manipulating your relevance, means that you're gonna be changing stuff all the time. And in order to sort of know that you're doing something right, you need some sort of measurement system and you need to be able to measure that my change, well, the result set before my change and the result set after my change. Am I, am I ac actually making things better or am I actually making things worse? Now out there, there's a lots of, of, of ways of actually measuring these things. Um, a lot of people use MAP, mean average precision. Uh, we here actually ref prefer to use a normalized discounted cumulative game or NDCG, and these are very complicated equations that I'm not going to jump into, but it basically gives you a measure of, of whether or not your result set is in an upward trend towards a value of one, which is your perfect value. And yeah, as I said, there are others out there, precision at n, in the ECG at n, where n denotes the, the metrics. Uh, there's mean reciprocal rank, uh, Kendall's tower, Spearman's row, and a whole bunch of other things that I'm not going to sort of tie into because I want to get to the meat of the thing, which is learning to rank. All right, so, yeah, we, you have to have your obligatory Wikipedia uh, definition. So, learning to rank, or machine learn, learned ranking, MLR, is the application of machine learning, typically supervised, semi-supervised, or reinforced learning in the construction of ranking models for information retrieval systems. Training data, blah, blah, blah. And what this means is we're gonna try and not manipulate the result set with AI. But what we're saying is we want to manipulate the order in which the results get returned. And for that, we use a plugin, well, I will show you a demo, a plugin called Elasticsearch Learning to Rank, which is a third-party plugin. It's not currently supported by Elasticsearch, uh, but it is uh, by a reputable company called Open Source Connections, uh, which some of you might know. Right, so how does it work? So for a specific query, we sort of know what we want to see. We're professionals in our content. We sort of know, okay, if I search for this, I want to see these results on page one. Uh, these are somewhat important, these are not important. So what we do is we basically say, this is my query. For my query, I have a result set, and I look at the result set and I say, is result one, I give it a grade, relevant, somewhat relevant, not so relevant, not relevant at all. So we give it a scale of four, it's called the SVM rank model, and then you create a judgment list or a golden set as it's sometimes referred to, which is just your ideal set for a specific query. And what you have in here is obviously your grade for that result and you have a query ID, which is your document ID, your unique identifier within your index, uh, or the query ID. So in this case, let's say I'm querying for uh, Harry Potter. Harry Potter will be my query ID with one. And then <coughs> the, the doc ID that I want to return at that position and just an optional, which is the title, so you know what you're actually looking at. But you don't need that. It's basically the first three fields that's the important part. 
once you've done creating your ideal list, you need to obviously tell this machine learning algorithm its connection to your index. What does the document have? What am I searching against? Basically, the fields that I'm going to be querying, what are those? So you create what's called features, which is just small sets of QDSL for Elasticsearch, uh, which basically say, I'm going to do a match. And can't really zoom this, but I want to do a match against the title. I want to do a match against the overview of the document. And this is called a feature. Now I have my judgment list and I have my feature set. I can actually go and train the model. So what this does, uh, yeah, so with the judgment feature set in place, the next thing you derive is the ranking function. Now there are a number of different models uh, out there uh, that, that does this, uh, all contained within RankLib, which is a, a ranking library. And each one of them attempt to minimize the error on the ranking function. So it's all basically error correction uh, AI. Uh, so yeah, there's, as I said, lots of different models. You have tree-based models, Lambda, Mart, Mart, Random Forest. You have SVM-based uh, models, and then you have linear models, which you can utilize to train. And you can train your set with this judgment list and this feature set against any of these models, and or these, these training models, and then it builds an actual model for you that you can load to Elasticsearch via this plugin. Right. So uh, let's see if this actually works. Yeah. So this is, this is the thing. You have to go and see which one is the best. It depends. So your feature set might be pretty complex. Uh, and then a linear might work better for you than, than, than a tree or, or the other way around. So you have to go and evaluate. So what I, I did was I basically went and just quickly took the LTR demo, modified it a bit. Uh, and with this, I iterate through every single one of them. And I'll show you now how that works. And you'll see that some of them are better than others. All right, so let's uh, see if I can get this. OK, cool. So yeah, I just quickly put together a little Django site so that we can actually see this in action. Um, so you will need, obviously, uh, Elasticsearch. I'm using 671 for this demo. Uh, Python, I'm using 3.6, uh, JRE to, to, to run. Um, and then, obviously, the Elasticsearch plugin. Uh, there's a URL. I don't know if anybody can see it, but uh, just you can just Google Elasticsearch learning to rank plugin, and you will find it. Uh, and then, obviously, the, 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 the training library, which is a RankLib library. Uh, the, uh, they suggested using uh, RankLib 2.8, uh, but for this specific demo, we're using uh, Ranky Make Rank Face, which is an improved version that uh, Open Source Connections pushed out. And then, of course, you need an index to test this against. So uh, what we're using here is just the movie database, or movie DB. All right, and, and again, this, the same steps that I, that I went through. You, you prepare your Elasticsearch, you install the plugin. Uh, the plugin will create a new index uh, um, system-based index called uh, LTR store. Uh, and then you do the same steps. You create your features, which touches your index. You create your judgment list, which is your golden set of what you want to achieve. Uh, then you go and train the model, and that's just basically Python running the, the, the judgment and feature files through this jar, and it spits out uh, a bunch of models, which you then load into the LTR index in Elasticsearch. And then you could, yeah, it publishes it to Elasticsearch, and then you can go and do a search and test. All right, so the movie database. So I've already f messed up, and there's a bug in here that I can't fix, but anyway, <laughs> there wasn't any time. But let's start now. Okay, so let's do a search for Harry Potter. And we see what we get. Yeah, okay. So we get the starving game. First result, the starving game. That's not... Harry Potter. But as you can see, I sort of did a little bit of a hit highlight here. Uh, and the description or the overview of this is, says a spoof movie that references Hunger Games, the Avengers, Sherlock Holmes, and the Harry Potter saga. So Harry Potter is there. And if I search for it, it hits. But this is not Harry Potter. All right, so that's just a basic query. So this is 
all I did here was, in my search, I built QDSL, which says, do a multi-match against title and overview for this value that I'm putting in. That's it. No fancy stuff, just to show what normal people would usually execute. So why is starving games at the top? So earlier I explained about um, term frequency and, and, and TFIDF, term frequency, uh, inverted document frequency. So if we look at this overview, and if I look at how many characters are in there, and I look at Harry Potter, and Harry Potter actually makes up quite a large section of that, which means if you look at it in context, Harry Potter makes up a large portion of this document. It makes up almost 20% of the overview. So if we can look, we can go and look at Elastic's Explain. All right, and I can see, if I look at the overview, the term frequency and the inverted document fr uh, frequency, I can see that I get pretty high high numbers here, 7.2, 9.5, uh, causing a value of 16.8. And you can see it, uh, tiny, tiny, but yeah, that is 16.8. <laughs> anyway, so, so the relevant score coming back from Elastic is very high because it's a tiny document and the term that I'm searching for makes up a large portion of this document. So that's why it's saying this is the most relevant depending on the score. And then we have Harry Potter at least because Harry Potter is in the title, so it scores there and it scores in the, the overview. So that's my next best. And then I get Epic Movie, which also has Harry Potter in it. The Hand, which just has Harry because the term gets, or the phrase, the two words gets searched uh, as individuals as well, obviously. And then here's the rest of them. This is, this is rubbish. I can't, I can't have this as a search for, for, for my website, people are gonna say it sucks. So how do, we, how do we fix this, right? So obviously, from an elastic perspective, what I can do is I can manipulate my query. And that's the simplest way, right? But again, I'm diverging from what I'm trying to, to show you, but that's how we could do it. So uh, let's say we um, do this and we modify our improved query to say, well, let's add a bool in here and we should match uh, title and overview and we should match phrase as well for uh, the terms coming in. And we can do something like that, which just makes it slightly better. And if I use that and I search, I'm like, whoa, all right, brilliant, solved my problem. But this is a very simple and basic model. Unfortunately for us at LexisNexis, you know, I can't just modify the query because the different types of documents that we have in a single index is so different that you can't just say, well, let's just modify the query like this. So we need something a little better. All right, so how are we gonna do this? So what I said did was, now let's see, I, I installed LTR, I've created my feature set, my goal set, and I run the trainer. I don't know if you guys wanna see it, you wanna see it? All right, let's just see which one is it. Uh, what's that? Is this, yeah. All right, so I can do. Boom. All right, so then it goes and it, it queries and it builds up its data sets for that judgment list against the features and it does its error correction for each of the models. You'll see it looping. All right, and then it loads all of that into my elastic index. All right, small judgment list, full feature set, so it doesn't take long. The more complex this goes, the longer it will run. All right, so now we've got and done our training. So I can now say, well, okay, cool. Let's select a model and see how it affects us. So let's start with Mart, and I do Harry Potter again. Damn it, starving game is still number one. But at least now, if we look at two, three, four, five, and six, it's looking much better. So basically, I've done nothing. It's, it's the same query. All we've done is we've now loaded a model into Elasticsearch. And what we do is we modify the query by adding a rescore. And the rescore, we tell the rescore, use this model. So it's, it's going to just apply a rescore on the finalized results from the exact same query 
but now the model is deciding the order. So we've done that for Mart. It's, it's okay. Look at RankNet, see what that does. Oof, no, that still looks terrible. So as you can see, they're not all equal. We can go look at, at Rank Boost. Mm, slightly better. Slightly better, but I see I still have some scragglers here at the bottom. And obviously the reason for that is I'm searching for Harry Potter, and Harry Potter only exists in the title here. Uh, but these others might have Harry and Potter appearing multiple times. So look at that. Potted plant, but there we go. There's Potter. Potter's in there. And this is probably, oh, there's Peter Potter. So it, 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 it basically says, well, that must be relevant. All right, so we can look at Ada. See? Ooh. All right, so, so Ada so far seems to be what I'm looking at. I see then the Starver games still come up here, and I still have my scragglers at the bottom, but at least now my first six results are actually, or my first five results are accurate, or semi-accurate. All right, I can carry on, but just to show you, this is sort of what it does. Um, and then, yeah. Mm-hmm. Can, can choose. Can choose. No, yeah, but that's, see, that's what I'm saying. You can create specialized forms. So our advanced forms do, it does the same thing. So I'm going to say, okay, I know that my document um, has uh, was in this court. It happened in this court. So then I can say, okay, go to my my uh, case law search form, and there's a there's a field there that says court and I can put the court in there, and it will only return the ones where that court exists. And then I can post filter on that, say, well, okay, I'm only looking for ones that's in KZN, or I'm only looking for this, and you, you post filter after the fact. Anyway, but yeah, so this is, in short, what LTR can do for you. You can have um, results coming back, and you can actually increase your golden set, and you can increase your feature set, and you can make it as complex or as least compl complex as you want. And this will actually then modify your result set coming out with a rescore. It's, a, it's not AI in the sense that this thing will basically look after itself and have children at some stage. And, come back and, and tell you what you want to search for instead of what you're <laughs> looking for. But it, it, it is quite a cool step util utilizing error correction to, to get a result set that would be better for your customer and tuning it to that effect. So how do you, how do you basically, how do you set the golden sets? This is, this is the question that lots of people are like, how do you set your golden sets? So there's multiple ways of doing this. Um, what, what we're going to try and do is basically, uh, and we're going to have uh, recurring sessions with expert, expert panels. We're going to get them in. We're going to supply them with 100 queries. Let's say we go and fetch the top 100 queries from the previous month. And we now say, okay, here's your 100 queries. We're going to execute this, but we'll probably write, well, we're busy writing an interface to do that. Uh, you put in the query and it spits out the results set and then our people can go and mark them, relevant, less relevant, somewhat relevant, not relevant at all. And then you capture that, and then I have my judgment lists. Now that I have my judgment list, I as a, as a relevance engineer or elastic engineer, I know which, which fields are touched by my QDSL. And so then I can build the feature sets, they can actually mark it up, and we can run it, and we can apply a model, and we can actually then go and tell them, okay, Mark this again, is this better, is this worse? And we start tuning it, tuning it, tuning it until after a while we get to optimal position. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not a you know, implement and win, but you can actually tune this to a point where you will get exactly what you need out of your result sets. All right, I don't uh, think I've had... Uh, uh, so, okay, so yeah, I, I touched this, but this is not really necessary. So for the TF-IDF issue, uh, 
don't ever do this. <laughs> um, so I just said, well, I, I'm actually looking for the Harry Potter in the overview and not just Harry. So I can do it. I said, well, okay, let me go and, and, and re-index my, my index. Uh, I update my query and I use painless as Neil will, will show us soon. And I said, well, okay, go find Harry and make it Harry Potter. <laughs> Um, obviously, for the query, Harry Potter. So, uh, and then I found out, well, actually, then I, where it is Harry Potter, it made it Harry Potter Potter. So I had to go and fix that again with another, <laughs> another update query. But, I mean, as I said, it will be a continual process between you as a search engineer and your editorial people. Because you can go and give feedback models and say, like, listen, we're noticing that people can't find this because you don't mention this actually anywhere in the document. Please, can we try and update it? So, and with LTR, we can start tuning and tuning and tuning until we get to where we want to be. All right, so that's, that's it for the demo. Uh, let me just carry on here. Uh, uh, great. Sorry. Okay, so what are we looking at next? So a couple of things that we're looking at uh, next at Lexis Nexus that um, we now have introduced, or recently introduced, an, an AI department within our technical development department. Uh, and uh, obviously a lot of cool stuff is coming out of that. Uh, some of the things that we're trying to do is hook the input terms as they're coming in. So we want to actually develop a natural language processor or interpreter on our input terms. Uh, because we've noticed that people are searching less uh, text-based search and they actually more natural language search we can see it changing so, so whereas previously people would type keyword 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 hit search it's now it's like how do i find the and uh, and obviously that made our search go all right so so we're trying to to sort of find a way to to first hook that before it goes to elastic extrapolate out the the important values, like we can see that this is a value, this is a keyword, this is a stop word, I can drop it off, uh, and, and just make our search a bit smarter that way. Uh, we currently have an implementation running uh, on our production site for an intent engine. So this, the, the query is coming in. Uh, we basically push to an intent engine first, and that gives us a probability for a document type, uh, uh, which is great. So then. That comes back, and if it's higher than a specific threshold, we say, yeah, okay, this is probably this document type that we're looking for. And then we modify our QDSL going to Elasticsearch and say, well, okay, boost this document up. Um, and then, yeah, for the LTR project, we're going to be looking at targeted uh, groups to explicit feedback models. So that's the same process. Get the expert group in, sit them down, run a query, apply a change, run the query again, have them mark it up. And then also, at a later stage, we are looking at implicit feedback models straight out of the, the front-end solution, uh, which is going to be a little more complicated, but uh, I'm pretty sure we can, we can pull that off. All right. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's that. So my name's Neil. I'm from Knowledge Focus. I've uh, been working, for, working in search for the last uh, 20 years or so. So with a number of search engines and with Elasticsearch for the last four years or so. Um, so I'll just be doing a very quick presentation on painless. Uh, don't want to bore you guys with all the details. Uh, I'd rather show you a couple demos. Um, so hopefully after this, you'll all want to be playing with painless. So what is painless? Uh, painless is a scripting language designed specifically for Elasticsearch. 
It has been designed from the ground up with uh, security and performance in mind. Uh, so it's very performant. Uh, there's also a strict whitelist of methods and classes, porting all of Java's data types and a subset of the Java API. Uh, there's optional typing and it uses a groovy style syntax. So as I said, uh, painless is optional typing. So we can either declare our variables explicitly the same way we would in Java. So as you can see, we, well, an int, a string, a double, or whatever. Um, or we can use the keyword def uh, to declare our variables and the type will be assigned at runtime. So the way we use painless, we can uh, either use our painless scripts in line. So we just use the syntax where we have script, source, and optional parameters that we pass to the, to the script. Um, and note that this um, syntax is the same no matter where we use a painless script. So it's always, always in that same format. Uh, there are some subtleties with uh, working with the, with the actual fields, um, but I'll speak about that a bit later. Uh, the other option, we, so we have inline scripts or we can store our scripts. So uh, for a stored script, we can just write this directly to Elasticsearch's um, cluster state. So we create in the script call, called increment, oh, sorry called increment counter and then later when we want to use that script we just access it using its ID. So use cases, um, we can use it in an ingest pipeline. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the ingest node in Elasticsearch, uh, it's an, an ingest pipeline is used to pre-process a document um, before you actually index it, uh, a lot like Logstash. So a lot of what you can do in Logstash you can do in an ingest pipeline. Uh, we can also use in the re-index API. So we might want to copy um, our data from one index to another and we can use painless to manipulate it slightly add some fields, change, change the format of fields, change types, whatever. Uh, we can also uh, use painless to access document fields for if we're doing searches or aggregations or in Watcher, things like that. So uh, painless has different contexts, as I was saying, and the syntax is slightly different. So on an ingest node, we access the fields that way. Um, in updates, where we update the documents directly on the index or um, using the re-index API. And then search and aggregations, uh, where we can run scripts as part of our queries. Uh, as you can see, for search and aggregations, we can just use doc to access the field, and that uses Elasticsearch's doc values, which is very efficient. Um, lastly, if we don't have access to a field, for instance, we can retrieve it from the source, but it's not recommended as it actually needs to pull the source, pass it, and actually take the values out for every document, which can be very inefficient. Would make sense to do a re-index or something so you've actually got that that field handy. That's the presentation. So now I can show you some demos. Um, sorry. 
Uh, so the first demo is just a simple one where I've got um, some statistics for some footballers for three seasons. So what I've got here, I've got the, the players, um, just the first name, last name, games played, how many goals they scored, how many assists, and their birth date. So what I'll do, I'll just uh, create an index with those documents. So as you can see, that's created. I've just done a, a, bulk, a bulk insert. And then what I'm going to do, I'm just going to uh, do a re-index to a, another index so that I can play around with the data and not mess around with my source. So as we can see, I've created those two, those two indices. They've got uh, 26 documents each. Um, okay, so let's look at this new index I created, um, LFC test. Uh, Elasticsearch has automatically created our mappings for us. It's guessed that born was a date, um, assists, all the assists, goals, game, games played, all, are all longs, and then first name, last name, it's indexed as text and keyword, as, as it would for any string. Um, uh, if I do a search, I can see my documents. I've got first, last name, I've got um, games played, goals, you can see there's three values for those, the arrays, and those are numeric values. So let's look at the first, first document. So let's do something very simple where we want to um, create a title for the document. So we're gonna search over these documents and we want to display a title and we don't want to have to concatenate things uh, when we, when we display it to the user. So we can do something very simple where we update, we call the update API um, on that document and we create a very simple script where it's setting the title to be first name with a space in between and the last name. So what I can do is just run that, it's updated the document and then I, I'll just do a search for solo. And then as you can see, we have title, Mohamed Salah. So we can do something quite similar for total goals. So as you can see, we've got a goals field there. Um, it's just a long and you can see it's an array of three values. So what we can do is create a slightly more complicated script we just um, initialize in total goals. Then we loop through the goals field. And for each value, we just add it to total goals. And then finally, we can just set our, our field total goals to the value there that we have in our variable. If I do that, I can search, I'm just doing wherever total goals is greater or equal zero. And as you can see, over here we have total goals 59, which is those three values added up. Um, another example, let's take another player. Um, we can Look at the mapping, so as you can see that I pointed out before, born is a date. And what we can do is we can um, update this, this document and we want to take his birth year. So we want to be able to compare the birth years of all the players. What we do is, so this might be a bit confusing uh, initially, so we write in uh, born, which we saw as a date, to a string. This is because it's actually taking the source that we put into Elasticsearch and not what is in the index. 
So it's taking our source document, and our source document was just that string where it was um, year, month, day. Uh, then what I can do is I set the format. I say it's year, month, day. I can pass it and load that into a, a date variable, which is born date. And then I can just retrieve the four digit year. Lastly, I can just assign that to a new field called birth year, and I'm just converting that from a string to an integer. So I'll just do a search for documents that include birth year. And as you can see at the bottom there, it's just taken that birth year and it's written it to a field. So something very simple. Um, to do. Um, so just a handy command if you haven't seen that before um, to retrieve all your scripts from your cluster state. Uh, there isn't a, a really easy way to do that so it's just a handy um, handy command that you you can take note of. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so yeah, we're searching of our, our documents. Uh, what we want to do is uh, calculate total games played, total goals, total assists, and get the birth year all in one. So what we can do for goals, assists, and games played, we can just have a variable for each, total of each, and then for each of those, so games played, um, goals and assists, we just have three loops for those as we had before. And we're just adding those values to our total games played, total goals and total, total assists. Then we can assign it to new fields. Then as before, the title of the document. Um, I've just done the first name and the last name. And then the birth year. It's exactly the same as before. So what I'm doing is um, posting this to the cluster state. So I'm creating this script inside the cluster state just to see that it's there. There's our script. Now what we can do is for this document, Virgil van Dyke, we will update it, and we can just say, call this script with this ID, which is LFC reindex. So all I do is I run that, and it's updated that document. If I have a look, you'll see we have born, total games played, total goal assists, total goals, total assists, title, and birth year. So we've just done that with a very simple painless script. So just to show a little bit of what painless can do, we can obviously create functions. So what I've done here is created a function called getSum, which calculates the sum of the items. So it returns an int, and all it does is it loops through the items that we send it and it adds it to total. So what we can do is we can just call that script for all of games played, assists, and goals, because, there's, because it uses the, I mean, it's the same logic. So otherwise, the script is the same. As you can see, there's our new script. So what we can do is re-index all of the documents now. We're happy with our script. And we write it to a new index using that, that painless script. Now I can just show, show the data. I'm just doing a simple aggregation here. Um, the most common birth years. Uh, the highest number of games played and the players, assists, and goals scored. 
So I'll just run that. And as you can see, uh, birth year most common is 1991 with five players, in 92 with four players. Games played, the most is um, Roberto Firmino with 142, uh, Juan Oldham with 138, and Milner with 131. Then assists, the top is Salah with 26, Firmino with 24, and um, 20 is James Milner and Trent Alexander-Arnold. Uh, same with goal scored. So it's just a very simple way of how we can uh, create new fields, manipulate our data when doing a re-index or updating the documents uh, on the fly. So um, we don't have to re uh, get the data back from the source and change maybe our, say, a SQL script or something like that. All we can do is just simply in plainness, create a new index uh, and run it through a plainness script. So um, now I've got a practical example that I encountered at uh, one, of, one of our clients. So we are indexing documents directly from a content management system. Um, Real-time <coughs> updates and our data was in JSON from the CMS and we just want to write it to Elasticsearch. So real-time updates, we didn't want to push it through log slash or anything, we just want to write it directly to Elasticsearch and uh, take the data. So uh, there's an example of a document, but there's only like a small subset of, the, of that whole JSON, JSON document that can have hundreds or even thousands of nodes. So in this example, we're interested in what is in detailed information. So yeah, we have detailed information Heading John Cleese, and we've got a little bit of content on John Cleese. And then we might have a different node, which is detailed information and has a dynamic, the node has a dynamic name. So now we have a problem that we have all these nodes all over the place, and we need to pull this data together and index it into a single field. So I'll just create that document. Um, as you can see, the mappings are created just from this simple JSON document. All these dynamic nodes. And there's the document we've indexed. Um, so I can do a search over this. There's fine detailed information heading. I'll search over John Cleese. which is all good and well, but then how would I search over, for instance, Eric Gardel? I, that's a dynamic node. Uh, by default, it will go into detailed information with that number content. So um, the usual way to do this is um, using dynamic templates. So Elasticsearch has something called dynamic templates where we can say, in our mappings, we say dynamic templates, and one way of doing it is matching a path. So we say path match. We can use a wildcard there. So anything begin that begins with detailed information um, and then has heading, we can copy that to title and content. And then for detailed information, um, content, we just write it to content. And then we've got our two fields, title and content, and we store these so we can just easily access them and not have to go back to the source. So I'll just create that um, dynamic, well, I'm creating the index with those um, dynamic templates. So what I'll do is I'm just going to index that exact same. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Thomas. I work for Derivco. Uh, we're in Amschlange, and uh, we're quite a large global uh, gaming company. Uh, we've got a pretty big Elasticsearch uh, deployment. Uh, we've got it sitting in t uh, two data centers, and the third one's coming up uh, quite soon. Um, specifically, what we're going to be talking about is our journey in using Elasticsearch to track all of our F5 data. Um, our F5 sits on the edge, and we basically process a lot of the data in um, Elasticsearch to 
find stuff. Um, so we do a lot of ingestion. Uh, we basically store a million things in Elasticsearch. Everyone can use it for anything. Um, and this is just our F5 input at uh, half a million documents a minute. Um, it gets pretty gnarly, and we suffer the outages, but it's fine. Most of the time, it stays up. Um, with the F5 data, uh, Nick, uh, who works with us, me, uh, he basically comes to us about every second day and asks us to ingest more F5 data. He comes up with new VIPs or new uh, data sets, and he just pushes more and more. And we currently have an engineer that works just for him dealing with his F5 data, because it's ridiculous. It, wa it was probably half that about two months ago. Um, so this was 2018, and this is an email I sent. This is a real email, except I changed the two there. Um, uh, we had uh, a, a Russian. Uh, we kind of knew he was Russian later on, um, but we basically, we were being attacked. Uh, one of our customers politely told us that they felt that there might be a brute force going on. Um, so at the time, we were actually using uh, some of our DB calls to record information and store it somewhere. And it was not very effective, but we didn't have anything else. Uh, so that was in November. Um, when we were ingesting, all, well, sorry, I'm just lost here. So when we were ingesting a lot of this data, uh, initially what we were bringing into the F5 was request and response logs from our APIs. Um, the payloads that we were getting to try and trying to deal in Logstash and then uh, insert into Elasticsearch was uh, quite problematic. Uh, prior to uh, Big IP 12.1, there was a limit to how big a payload could be, and you'd get a nice little key value that said it was truncated, which meant you now have broken JSON, so you can't ingest anything. So basically, uh, at this time, the data sitting in Elasticsearch, there was a lot of it, and it was useless. We really couldn't do all that much with it. Um, we started finding ways of minimizing the amount of ingestion that we were doing, and we slowly started getting a handle on things. Um, once we started understanding the data and were able to actually process it uh, and not have as many drops, um, we were finally able to really look at it. We decided to only do the re uh, response data uh, with an API call, a request uh, payload. If it doesn't make it all the way to the, to the server and a response is sent back, do you really care? Because we do quite a, a huge number of API calls, um, it was easier to just drop the responses and assume that if we got a complete, uh, sorry, drop the request, if we get a, a complete response payload, um, we'll just ingest that and we'll see what we can learn. What, as I said, once we managed to figure this out and start uh, limiting what we got, uh, this is when we started being able to use machine learning to start tracking the Russian. Um, this was uh, this was December 2018. Um, on the version of the F5 that we had, uh, it was already quite uh, it was running quite high. It was quite overworked at the time. Uh, to turn on any uh, mitigation profiles was kind of cost us, and it started getting a bit gnarly. So we set up machine learning jobs similar to this one that would then identify when there were a lot of uh, failed login attempts coming from uh, the Russian. So we would then generate alerts, and we would basically phone Nick at 3 in the morning and say, please turn on the, log the mitigation profiles. And he would, and the guy would then go away uh, for a couple of days. And that's kind of as good as we could get, because we didn't really know uh, how else to do this. Um, the machine learning, all the work we had done in machine learning prior to this, because we didn't understand the data, we couldn't really do anything with it. So machine learning wasn't really working for us at that point. Again, and I'm probably going to say this many times, like cleaning up your data and understanding what you're ingesting helps, especially at volume like this. Uh, and machine learning has actually turned out to be pretty cool for us. We use it for a lot of things. Um, uh, there's a couple of guys uh, that are now writing their own machine learning um, processes, and we're getting a lot of help from it. Um, then came the German. It wasn't long after that. 
totally different type of attack instead of that brute force of the previous one was 40,000 events a minute. I don't know, I, I forget. It was so long ago. Um, the German was totally different, Mo uh, pretty much only from a couple of cloud providers in Germany, much slower, one or two login attempts a minute for months on end, which, again, like, again all the previous work we had done had started help helping us identify this. Um, this is where Nick uh, came up with the honeypot method. We realized that, uh, yeah, we realized that um, if we could identify the, the bad guys, we could basically send a fake payload to say, hey, your login failed. And the guy could carry on trying indefinitely. He would never make it through. Uh, it also meant that we didn't uh, absorb the cost of doing the full uh, transaction of trying to log the guy in. So to my knowledge, I think he's still sitting there just doing a slow attack from Germany and it comes through every minute forever. And it's cool, it's being handled. Um, so in, what was that, March, April, in April, um, sorry, <laughs> we, yeah, there's, there's no logo for Watcher, so <laughs> that's what I Googled and I saw the Witcher, so yeah. Uh, we had this bad actor idea. Um, we basically were going to start creating a catalog of good and bad IP addresses, uh, known malicious cloud providers, that we could just put into the bucket. Um, our idea was basically to uh, ingest all the logs from the F5, all the API calls, use the Witcher to go and find the number of uh, failed login attempts by IP address and start working on buckets of IP addresses. We send that back to Logstash to process all the IP addresses, which then gets fed back into the F5 into a blacklist. and that those IP addresses would sit for a TTL, whether it be five minutes or 30 minutes. Um, it was a pretty cool idea, but it got a bit gnarly when uh, you start blocking players' IP addresses and it's on us to make sure that it's right, and I didn't really want to take the risk. Um, which also sparked further con uh, conversations uh, around some of our users uh, that the customers use to, uh, to deal with, to work with our APIs. Um, in one of the parts of the business, they started uh, using a similar method for, uh, 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 in the fraud department, and they were basically finding people that were logging into the system, uh, particularly, let's say, most commonly from Europe and most commonly only from a couple of countries, and then suddenly there'd be a login attempt, a failed login attempt from China. And it's anomalous, it's weird, it's something that they could pick up on. And they've actually taken that really far uh, to the point, well, yeah, they, they've done some pretty cool stuff. Uh, their fraud, fraud department works primarily with that now. Um, yeah, it's cool, it's basically it's just an ingestion for this, but for them, uh, they're, they're actually processing their data in Logstash again. Um, I'm sure they're probably using pipelines, though. I haven't spoken to them for a while. Um, so then comes a month or two ago with bot detection with the latest version of um, the F5 version 14. It is 14. Um, bot detection came along and there's just no more fun to be had because it does everything we ever wanted it to do. It blocks everything it identifies. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it sends challenges if it needs to. If it's known bots, it blocks. It knows when it's pager duty that's coming through the firewall. It knows everything. Um, this is his, has been his uh, pride and joy for the last couple of months, and I think he just stares at reams and reams of this Elasticsearch data just to see bot detection happening, because it's completely hands-off now, right? You don't have to do any work anymore, so. It, yeah, so now what he does is every, like, every couple of days he comes over and asks this other dude, Rob, to plead, like, he has another data set, so he has another 5,000 events a second that we need to ingest, because he wants to do more crap like this. Um, <laughs> And then comes our uh, DDoS attack that we had recently. Um, bot detection started throwing so many logs at us that our Logstash clusters started dying and couldn't keep up. Um, it wasn't load balancing properly. Uh, yeah, but the DDoS attack, you might be able to 
talk more about it. But uh, it was pretty intense and we couldn't handle it at all. Um, millions and millions. Do you know how many API requests there were? 360 gigs a second. Yeah, it was nuts. That was in, in Europe, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, sorry to be so brief, but that is just kind of from our, our usage of how we've gone on this journey of trying to deal with the baddies that are trying to get through our APIs. Um, so, I mean, what Thomas has talked about is the journey that we've had through security. I mean, from the F5, we've been working with Elastic for a lot longer. You know, we started with HTTP requests. Um, I mean, for those of you that don't know what an F5 is, I guess it's a load balancer initially but it's now really a security appliance. Um, and as we've taken that journey in the last year and a half to 18 months, we've started to ingest more and more data. But um, I guess most of you will work with applications and when your application stops working, the first thing you blame is something you don't understand. And that was me in Derivco. At least that's how I felt. Um, so we started building quite a lot of work with Elastic and it was quite a cool way for us to show the data that we had on a box that was a, technically a black box to most people that work there into a format that pretty much anyone can see. Um, and then to race forward to where we are now, and what this is showing is against one of our major um, systems that <clears throat> earns someone a lot of money, not me, just takes a lot of time, but it gets advertised in premiership games. You know, it's a huge marketing campaign, and we need to make sure that it's running 24-7. Unfortunately, we don't get any downtime windows. Um, and this was a login attack that we mitigated this Monday. It was actually quite cool. Tim's team who's over there, they're busy looking at taking the service from us as well. And um, I was able to show them it in real time and do a real demo. Um, and there was a guy trying to log into the system with credentials that were stolen off the internet um, or that he had purchased at least. Uh, most of them wouldn't have worked, but at the type of scale that he's doing there, um, over a five-hour five period, it was about one and a half million or just short of that 1.2 million, I guess, um, you know, that could have easily taken that system offline. Um, even though he would never have been successful with the credentials he was using, um, we were able to stop that and mitigate and keep the system running without any noticeable application metrics that were sort of dropping or any players that weren't able to play. Um, and that's kind of where we are now. So that happens. Someone in my team gets a page of duty alert from a watcher. They tell the team involved, and we're very close to having it where we can actually tell the team at the same time, and we all carry on with our day, and we can carry on working, and we don't have to sit there and manage this for days and lose production time, or at least work time in doing new cool stuff. Um, not that this wasn't cool when it started in November or August, whenever it was. Um, just another diagram of the same thing. I mean, you can see the volumes that this guy tried to attack us with. You know, no one believes you when you say it was over 20,000 IPs, but when you show them in that graph, they can see it, right? Um, and my exec can understand what that means, and he can see the kind of impressive nature of what we're doing, not only at being ingested in Elastic, but also from the device that I look after. And then just, you know, other ways of displaying it. The IPs that he used the most, um, you know, where they were coming from, that sort of thing, which is quite cool. Nice to display it and show people at least that that's what we're up to. Um, as Thomas said, I mean, the reason why the guy carries on for so long and keeps going, and actually if you look back at that graph, you'll see that he gets, um, he tries harder and harder. It's because he thinks he's winning, but all he's doing is getting a response from the API off the F5 device, telling him that the account never didn't work. So even if the details were successful for any reason, the hope is that this would catch him and he would get a false response anyway and we would keep our players' data safe. We work in, the Europe, in Europe a lot, so GDPR is massive for us. Um, so it's very important that we have to be seen to be doing this kind of thing and actively mitigating it. And that was all that I had to say. Back to you, buddy. Um, so kind of like tips for not necessarily the, the large ingestion, but just dealing with this type of stuff is that um, without understanding your data, you're actually nowhere. You're just in the bush. So um, it took us a long time to actually realize that the data we were ingesting was crap um, because we were just ingesting so much of it. We, couldn't, we honestly just couldn't handle it. And then we had that 
truncated era and it was just a series of things. And when we actually sat down and started looking at the data and I actually learned what an API was and a subnet was, there's lots of things I've learned in this journey. Uh, we basically understanding your data has helped us a lot. Um, smart decisions about uh, what data you want to ingest, like making the decision of not ingesting your requests and only doing your responses was actually really beneficial to us. Um, it's like we're always assuming that we're going to start taking the request payloads again, but for now the response payloads are just more than enough. Um, the question I have weekly, the discussion I have weekly with Nick is you can have some of your data or none of your data, but you can't have all your data. So you have to choose what data you want. Um, we don't just ingest uh, all the key values. Uh, we basically strip out a lot of stuff because at the volume that we do, it's just, it's, there's a lot of data. Um, we've got a guy here who manages our elastic clusters and deployments, um, and he's forever dealing with millions and millions of gigs. Um, just to kind of limit that, uh, really, it's just choosing, uh, well, at least forcing other people to choose what data they really want to keep, because you don't have to have everything. You just have to have the, the, the real stuff. Um, after you've done all of that, then machine learning actually gets a lot easier because machine learning is like quite a black box sometimes and there's a lot of clicking around and pressing play and wondering what's going to happen. Um, if you've actually gone through the, the, the trouble of cleaning and working through your data, then machine learning helps and that really helps us with the Russian. Um, and just like an, an added thing, uh, I didn't know this until a couple of months ago, but um, a lot of clients and browsers, when you, do, when you call APIs, uh, it'll do an options call to see what's available and then it'll do your get and post. And if you're ingesting everything, you're actually ingesting two things. An options call which to say, hey, API, what options are there? And then also, you'd actually get the real uh, request or response from it. Um, you can't do machine learning when an options response time is five milliseconds and your get is 200 and your posts are 500, whatever they are. You can't do machine learning on that because just in a population, it just doesn't work. So again, going back and realizing that you don't need everything, uh, it's a huge amount of work to do, but it, it definitely helps. Um, uh, I always forget why you always talk about errors return quicker than successes. Just explain that again. Yeah, um, more. It's a significant amount of data, regardless, um, feeding that down up. I mean, I think they cleaned everything up for now until I'm ready to start implementing it. But it's down to about 70 megs of it. Um, is that right? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Significant it was, difference it was, in percentage wise, anyway. Wasn't it 750 gigs? It was, yeah, it was a ridiculous yeah. amount. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah, a lot, yeah. and then it was a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is the real thing. And then the other thing that we do with the F5 um, is we monitor the response time of applications behind it and URIs and stuff like that and, and report back to application teams. And what we realize is that when the applications are erroring, they actually respond faster. Right? So you've got to be very careful about that kind of thing when you're looking at response times for applications. You want to tell them it's erroring. And there was one other thing which I've just remembered now, uh, which goes back to the 
my same statement I've been making, which is clean your data and look at your data. Um, prior to the first major attack where we were suffering and needed to use the F5 data, uh, we only stored three days of data. That's all we could manage because it was just too much. Uh, it was too crazy. Um, after going through all of the, uh, three days is nothing. You basically can't do anything. You might as well throw in the bin. Uh, after all the work that we've done and with Jethro's help, uh, how much are we up to now? Four, 14 days. Uh, yeah, 14 days of hundreds of millions of documents a day. Uh, many, many, many gigs. Just making, like, just make sure you clean your data and don't let people, like idiots like Nick, just log everything. It'll help. Uh, any questions? Cool. Is that it? Yeah. No. Sorry to be so quick. No. <laughs> um, I'd just like to thank Thomas and Nick. That was great. Um, it's really cool to see some security analytics demos come through at the meetups. Um, that was the presentations for the evening. Um, I'd like to thank LexisNexis, um, the, the team that worked with you, Doug, it was Monet. No, the yeah. yeah, but I'd like to thank all of you for helping with the arrangements and setting this up. We're really excited to bring these type of events to, to Durban and to, to get to know other parts of the country's elastic community. Um, we do have them on, a, on, a, on a every three months. So if you have demos and presentations, please tell us. Like if we have another Durban Elastic Meetup, it would be great to see some more presenters and demos up here. Um, and further on, I'd just like to thank everyone for attending. Um, it was a great evening. Thank you very much. For, it was a great first foray into Durban. And hopefully we see you soon. Thank you for coming.